Welcome to Weekly Pulse. I'm your host, Lorenzo Reyes. It's holiday shopping season and everyone is emptying out their pockets, but I guarantee you no one is dropping dough quite like the MLB this offseason. From the MLB's winter meetings in San Diego, our very own Bob Nightingale provides the latest on Garrett Cole and Steven Strasburg's mega deals. And speaking of mega deals, should we be making one out of the Patriots' latest scandal? We provide the latest insight on Spygate 2.0. Get set for that. What's set in stone is a college football playoff. Paul Meyerberg provides our first look at the national semis, along with the latest Amway coaches poll, and gets you ready for the Heisman Trophy announcement this weekend. I know it's freezing outside, but believe it or not, we are less than a year away from the Summer Olympic Games in Tokyo. We sat down with surfers Carissa Moore and Caroline Marks to see how they fell in love with the sport and what it means to be a part of the first ever U.S. Olympic surfing team. Let's roll. Hi, this is Bob Nightingale from USA Today Sports, and this is what I'm hearing. Well, the winter meetings went into a complete frenzy on Tuesday night when Garrett Cole signed a staggering nine-year, $324 million contract. Pretty much works out to a million dollars a strikeout, considering he had 326 in the regular season last year. The contract completely blows away just what Steven Strasburg earned a day earlier when he signed for $245 million over seven years. And, of course, what pre was the previous record, David Price at $217 million with the Boston Red Sox. But the Yankees won their man. Now the evil empire is back. The Yankees said, when we want a guy, we get him. All of a sudden, the Yankees are the team that beat in 2020. They have a great rotation now, particularly with having Tanaka, Severino back, a fabulous bullpen, dynamic lineup, and hey, they're probably not even done. Hi, this is Bob Nightingale from USA Today Sports, and this is what I'm hearing. Well, Blockbuster signing today with Steven Strasburg returned to Washington Nationals seven years, $245 million. This guy already had four years and $100 million left in the contract. He opts out, gets the extra three years and 145. What does this mean? Well, Anthony Rendon is out of the door. He's looking right now at the Texas Rangers, Philadelphia Phillies, Los Angeles Dodgers. All three teams want this guy. He's probably gonna make at least $260 million. The Nationals, Mark Lerner says they cannot afford both. Things are heating up at the baseball winter meetings, and it was a blockbuster this morning. This is Bob Nightingale from USHA Sports, and this is what I'm hearing. Well, the winter meetings are over. What a week for Scott Boris, the agent who engineered and negotiated over $860 million in contracts. Mike Misaka signed last week, but then it was Steven Strasburg, seven-year contract for $245 million on Monday. Garrett Cole, $324 million on Tuesday. And now Anthony Rendon with a $245 million with the Los Angeles Angels. It was a stroke of genius for Boris, and it shows the uh, money is flowing once again in Major League Baseball. The Angels were a little bit of a surprise on Rendon. People thought he was going to Texas Rangers, but their offer was under $200 million. I was told the Los Angeles Dodgers never made an offer. The Washington Nationals offer was the same as it was before, about $210 million. Angels jumped in with a take or leave it offer, and Rendon took it. So now Mike Trout has a uh, great protection in that lineup, and the Los Angeles Angels become the first team in history with three players with contracts over $200 million. Quite a week at the winter meetings with the signing of Anthony Rendon, capping off a wild, wild spending spree. The Patriots got a jump on the developing story by issuing a statement and with Bill Belichick's public comments on Monday, which pretty much maintained that it was an honest mistake and not the beginning of Spygate 2.0. All while the NFL, as of late Tuesday afternoon, had yet to comment publicly on the situation. A league source told me that the Patriots' explanation is helpful as the NFL conducts its investigation, which I'm suspecting will surely wind up on the desk of Roger Goodell. But hold on a minute. If a report from the athletic.com on Tuesday is accurate, which maintained that eight minutes of the video footage focused on the Bengals sideline, then the Patriots will have a bit more explaining to do. Remember, these are the Patriots, 
implicated in 2015 in the deflate gate and busted in 2007 in Spygate. That too must factor into whatever decision Roger Goodell comes up with. In any event, the league source told me that with the evidence in the hands of NFL security, with the Patriots seemingly cooperating, this matter is on a fast track for an expeditious handling. The New England Patriots are in the news again because of a league investigation. But this isn't the first time the Pats have come under scrutiny. Let's look at the team's history of allegations of cheating. Back during the 2007 season, the NFL looked into a complaint from the New York Jets that alleged the Patriots had been filming New York's defensive signals. The NFL launched an investigation that found the Patriots in violation of the league's rules for the incident. As a result, the NFL fined Bill Belichick the maximum allowable penalty of $500,000 and also fined the Patriots organization $250,000. The NFL then also stripped the Patriots of their first round draft pick the following year. Then, more recently, was a highly debated Deflategate controversy. The Indianapolis Colts complained to the NFL officials, alleging that New England intentionally deflated game-issued footballs before the AFC title game in 2015. The NFL launched an investigation and had lawyer Ted Wells issue a report that stated it was, quote, more probable than not, end quote, that the Patriots intentionally deflated the footballs. The franchise vehemently denied and disputed this, even putting out its own written response to the report. Tom Brady was suspended for four games for the incident. He appealed, and after a summer spent in federal court battling out the case, he eventually withdrew that appeal and sat out the first four games of the 2016 season. Which brings us to this week. The Bengals complained that the Patriots were illegally filming their sideline. The Patriots admitted that they inadvertently broke league rules, but said it was all a part of a project profiling a day in the life of an advanced scout. The NFL has said it will be thorough with the investigation, but no matter how this one shakes out, the Patriots just seem to always find themselves under the microscope. The 2020 MVP race has already heated up. And when you look at the four main candidates, LeBron James, Luka Doncic, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and James Harden, you have candidates 1A, 1B, 1C, and 1D. It really just depends on your personal style that you enjoy watching most on the basketball court. And for my money right now, the MVP at this point of the season is Milwaukee's Giannis Antetokounmpo. He won his first MVP last season and his game has continued to improve, taking it to the next level. His scoring numbers are up. His two point percentage is fantastic. He's shooting and making more three pointers than he did last season. His rebounding is up. His playmaking is exceptional in Mike Budenholzer's offense and he just dominates inside the paint. Get Giannis the ball near the basket, and almost 80% of the time, he's going to get you two points. The other three guys I mentioned, Doncic, Harden, and James, they're having great seasons as well. There's a lot of basketball left to be played, and certainly things can change. And also, if you want to even look at another candidate, James's teammate, Anthony Davis, is having a great end of the season. But for my money, you take what Giannis Antetokounmpo does on the offensive end, what he does on the defensive end, you look at Milwaukee, they have one of the best teams in the NBA, they're atop the Eastern Conference standings, Giannis has proven that he's the best player in the NBA right now, and when you look at the big picture, we don't even know what his ceiling is. He still has four or five years to continue to improve, so he's only going to get better. We're just seeing the very beginnings of what this guy can do on the basketball court. And so far, it's been fantastic. The NBA has played a quarter of its schedule already. And we've had a good chance to see who the good teams are, who the bad teams are. And now is a perfect time to take a look at the top five NBA teams at this point in the season. And let's start with number five, the Miami Heat. Jimmy Butler the player of the week this week has the heat rolling with a good mixture of veterans and young players. Bam Adebayo, Tyler Hero, Kendrick Nunn, Eric Spolstra has the heat in good position so far. Number four, the Los Angeles Clippers. You have Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, and a deep team, plus Doc Rivers coaching. And the Clippers are putting it together on both ends of the court, even though Leonard has missed some games. Number three, the Boston Celtics. You add Kemba Walker to the lineup, 
You see the continued development of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum and the defense of Marcus Smart and the Celtics have emerged as one of the top teams in the Eastern Conference. Number two, the Los Angeles Lakers. LeBron James and Anthony Davis form the best duo in the league right now and the Lakers are just rolling over teams and they're getting some really strong performances from players you did not expect. JaVale McGee, Dwight Howard, Alex Caruso, and the Lakers are on top of the Western Conference. And the number one team in the NBA, the Milwaukee Bucks. Giannis Antetokounmpo is putting together another MVP season. The Bucks have the number one defense, the number two offense in the league, and they have the league's top net rating. Milwaukee is in great position right now. And coming up on the schedule December 19th, the Lakers play the Milwaukee Bucks. The selection committee has spoken. Finally, the debate is settled for the college football playoff. Here are your top four. Number one, LSU. Number two, Ohio State. Number three, Clemson. And number four, Oklahoma. Creates two really great semifinal matchups. To be honest, one's a little bit better than the other. Let's start in the Peach Bowl. That's number one, LSU, and the number four, Sooners. LSU obviously has been rolling all season on offense. They got the Heisman Trophy winner, very, very likely, and quarterback Joe Burrow. On Saturday night against Georgia, probably the best defense they've faced all season. LSU had 37 points. Burrow had 350 yards passing, four touchdowns. They just dominated. They looked the part. They earned number one by going unbeaten and closing with that SEC championship. Oklahoma's been kind of wishy-washy for about a month. They lost to Kansas State in November. They do have two really nice wins against Baylor. To beat LSU, however, will demand the most complete performance from Oklahoma all season. Certainly on defense, you need to play at a vintage, high level. Um, on offense, it's going to be the Jalen Hurts show, as it's been all season. He needs to play perfect. Odds are against Oklahoma. LSU's been that good. But OU's been in this spot. They've been in the playoffs three times. They've been in this situation in a semi against a favorite opponent before from the SEC. They know what it takes. It'll take a lot. The best game to me, Fiesta Bowl. Number two, Ohio State. Number three, Clemson. The two most complete and balanced teams in the country. Maybe not as flashy as LSU. Maybe Clemson didn't play the same schedule. It doesn't matter. These are very, very likely the two most complete teams in the country. It's almost a shame that they have to meet in the semis. Ohio State got tested for the first time against Wisconsin on Saturday night. They passed that test, outscored the Badgers 27-0 in the second half. Clemson has been destroying people since that close win against North Carolina. Just destroying people, most recently Virginia. An amazing matchup, incredible matchup between two incredible programs and incredible teams. The f whoever wins, the finals are gonna be incredible. To start with a favorite, that's LSU quarterback Joe Burrow. He of the 48 touchdowns, like 78% completion percentage for the number one team in the country. Just add up the numbers here. He's got the statistics. He's the quarterback. He's on the number one team in the country. It's all coming together. The only question for Burrow is not whether he'll win, because he's going to win. It's whether he will have the largest margin of first place votes in the history of the trophy. It's a possibility. Secondly, we have Ohio State quarterback Justin Fields, another transfer, making it big for a team in the playoff. Fields on the season, 40 touchdowns, one interception, I mean, that's outrageous, 50 combined touchdowns. Ohio State has gotten better in the transition to Justin Fields. It's kind of hard to believe, but they are better than ever offensively. Fields is obviously a big reason why. Third, we have Jalen Hurts from Oklahoma. Oklahoma has won the last two Heisman trophies at quarterback, Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray. Jalen Hurts is a finalist, obviously he's not gonna win. But he's had a fantastic, fantastic season. He's really carried the load to a degree that I don't think you saw Mayfield or Kyler Murray do to all Due respect to those guys, Hurts has really shouldered almost all the offense for Oklahoma, and he's been the difference for a team that struggled at times, still found a way to get to the playoff as the fourth seed. Lastly, the wild card. That's defensive end Chase Young out of Ohio State. I mean, a defensive guy is a finalist. Haven't seen it since Indomit can sue at Nebraska earlier this decade. Kind of amazing, but earned. Young's been dominant, unstoppable, unblockable. He's a finalist for the Heisman, even though he missed two games midseason. Really deserved. It's actually great to see a defensive guy in the Heisman when a guy is like Young and he's deserved it. From 1983 to 1991, Miami won four national championships. That's pretty good, right? Think about the fact that they won four national titles under three different head coaches. Jimmy Johnson, 
Dennis Erickson, and first Howard Stellenberger. I think that's incredible. And to me, that's the definition of a dynasty, is that multiple guys come and go, coaches, quarterbacks, stars, whatever, and the train keeps rolling along. And Miami for a decade was the team, the face of college football. Then in the 1990s, 1993 to 1997, Nebraska, 60 and three, three national championships. They played for a fourth, almost won that game. They missed a field goal at the buzzer. That's a dynasty as well under Tom Osborne. Look, for those four years, they were more physical than everybody. They were tougher than everybody. They were faster. They were quicker. They were just more of a team than anybody else because of the system that they ran. It hasn't been great since, obviously, but for those five years, Nebraska put themselves into the record books. And lastly, we have Alabama. Since 09, five national championships under Nick Saban, a couple Heisman Trophy winners, a couple Heisman Trophy finalists, and obviously the numbers prove it out. But in this era of increased parity with more teams in the mix for the national championship, greater depth in terms of coaching, to do what Alabama has done for the last 11 seasons, it's really incredible. Here are this week's risers and fallers. And we have to start in New Orleans, where one team went all the way from the fifth seed in the NFC to the top. The San Francisco 49ers won a thrilling back and forth battle against the Saints. And this time it wasn't their defense that helped them out, it was their offense. Now the Niners are 11-2 and in control. All they have to do is win and they'll have home field advantage throughout the playoffs. Which brings us to our first faller and it's Seattle. The Seahawks started the week as a number two seed and they dropped to fifth. Seattle looked slow Sunday night and the Ram offense did whatever it wanted. The good news for Seattle is that there's a battle brewing week 17 against the Niners. That game could determine who wins the NFC West and it could even determine some of that home field advantage that I was talking about earlier. Which brings us to our next riser. The Rams are 8-5 and five and they needed that victory against the Seahawks. They're still long shots for the wild card, but hey, you never know. This team did go to the Super Bowl last year, and at least for the moment, they're still alive. Which brings us to the team that the Rams lost to in last year's Super Bowl. The Patriots are again fallers. The offense did show some signs of life late in the loss against the Chiefs, but a slow start and some horrendous officiating proved to be their downfall. Still, they have a trip upcoming to Cincinnati, and there's nothing quite like playing the Bengals to boost your morale. Which brings us, finally, to the team that beat New England last week, the Texans. I really want to like them, I really want to feel good about them, but they are just so inconsistent. A letdown loss against the Broncos moved them into a first place tie in the AFC South, a tie against a red-hot Titans team. And because Houston and Tennessee still have to play each other twice in the final three weeks of the season, Houston better hope that the Titans go cold in this final stretch. Hi, I'm Caroline Marks. I'm 17 years old from Delaware Beach, Florida, and I'm a professional surfer. I'd say I got into surfing when I was eight years old, but I my very first wave when I was like super, super young, like three years old, two or three years old. Then I like stopped in horseback road, which is pretty funny, and then yeah, I just got back into it when I was like eight years old because of my brothers and I just really wanted to be like them and I realized for them to like accept me and think I was cool, I had to surf and like surf better than them so I just started surfing and you know, I've always loved like the water and the ocean and stuff like that but I just surfed again and I just like fell in love with it. It's the best thing in the world. The ocean's so humbling and it's the great equalizer so I think just you're constantly figuring out mother nature and trying to read the ocean and I think that's always going to be challenging but that's what makes it so much fun. Being the youngest person on tour has its challenges just because, you know, you're competing against women that have 10 or 15 more years of experience than you and that just comes with time. So that's something you kind of just have to accept and just be like, okay, that, no worries. Like, I'm just gonna read the ocean best I can. When you're in the water, it's definitely game time. There's no like, okay, here's a tip or anything, nothing like that. But I think they've all been super cool and rad and they've welcomed me and it's such a rad group of girls to have on the tour. So it's super cool to be a part of and um, I don't really ever want to stop. <laughs> My oldest brother introduced the whole family to surfing, so I'd have to say he's been the biggest influence in my whole entire career. And Having a big family is so cool, and I think they've been a huge part of my success, and I wouldn't be where I am without them. You know, They're so supportive and rad no matter what happens, and you know, all my brothers surf, which is so cool, and my dad as well, so. I'd say they push me more than anyone just because they know like what I'm capable of, and yeah, growing up, they gave me a lot of constructive criticism, and I used to come in crying sometimes, but now I really appreciate it because it helped me a lot and they're like my biggest supporters now, so wouldn't be where I am without them today, so I'm super fortunate to have them. It's a judging sport, so you have judges that are looking for speed, power, flow. This all depends on how the waves are, but speed, power, flow, difficulty in your maneuvers and how big the wave is. If you have a higher total than your other opponent, you win. In the tour event, there's always the same amount of heats. If you win your first heat, you skip to the third round, and if you don't, you go in the second round to have another chance to go into the third round, but there's round one, two, three, quarter, semis, finals. So there's six rounds. 
When I think about the Olympics, what I'm looking most forward to is the opening ceremony. And I, I think like surfing's first time in the Olympics, so no one really knows what it's gonna be like. So I'm just like really excited. I'm like, I don't know what it's gonna be like. I don't really have any expectations. I'm just excited to meet a bunch of new people. And um, I know my family's going, so I'm really excited. And obviously super excited to represent America. I'm just really excited for all of that. And then Tokyo, I've flown into Tokyo, but I've never spent time there. So I'm really looking forward to spending time there and going to all the little sushi bars. And there's like a bunch of little like toys, like cool little toy stores and stuff like that. <laughs> like really fun. So I'm looking forward to all of that. My name is Carissa Moore. I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii, and I'm a four time world champion. The person that has influenced my surfing career the most is probably my dad. He was the one who pushed me into my first wave and has been by me through it all and has continued to be my coach even till this day. He's literally given me the best gift um, a father could give his daughter. It's, it's been an incredible journey to be able to share this with him. I qualified for the 2020 Olympics through the World Championship Tour of Surfing uh, in 2019. I finished as one of the top two Americans. After winning my fourth world title in 2019, I'm going into the 2020 Olympics with no expectations at all. Of course, I'm gonna prepare the best that I possibly can and give the competition my best efforts, but I just wanna soak in the experience and have a really good time. My rookie year on the championship tour, the first few events I was really struggling to find my rhythm, find my place. Third event in was in New Zealand, and it was actually my dad's idea to kind of connect with a local club there. They ended up becoming my family on the road, and with their love and support, um, it carried me to a win there, and so I felt it was only right to give them the winnings from, from that event. For me, giving, it gives me such a sense of purpose and it really fills my heart and my soul. So being able to give a gift like that back to, to those local people really made my heart happy and truly that was better than, than winning that event was seeing how much happiness uh, that brought to the community. I think what I'm most looking forward to about the Olympics is being able to wear the American flag and represent Hawaii in particular. You know, I feel really connected to where I come from and, and the people there, so I don't only feel like I'm going there, you know, for myself, but for everyone that's behind me and has loved and supported me through this, this journey. One of the things that I'm most looking forward to about Tokyo is, um, for me, it's a full circle moment. I studied Japanese at, in high school, and so it'd be really fun to practice some of my Japanese, um, to just immerse myself in their culture, and um, eat a lot of sushi, surf their ways, and I'm just excited to be a part of the whole games, be a part of the opening ceremony, check out the village. Um, I think, you know, it'd be really cool to check out some of the other events and other competition going on at the same time. I think having surfing in the 2020 Olympics is a great thing for the sport. I think it will open it up to an even broader audience and hopefully the world really enjoys it. Arguably one of the best sporting events of the year takes place this weekend, Army versus Navy. And yes, this game is a throwback, but it's always a good watch. It's Heisman Week in New York, be sure to watch the presentation this Saturday night as Joe Burrow, Justin Fields, Chase Young, and Jalen Hurts vie for the most prestigious award in college football. The NFL playoff race reaches a fever pitch this Sunday when the Titans and Texans battle it out for first place in the AFC South. And I know it's the AFC South, but trust me, the winner of this division will be a dark horse in the AFC playoffs. Stick with Weekly Pulse, your heartbeat to what's trending in sports. Hey sports fans, if you want to see more videos like this, check out some of our other ones right here. And if you like what you see, hit the subscribe button and stick around for more from USA Today Sports.